February 6, 2022, Grace Bible Church, Grants Pass, Oregon. I am saved by Pastor John Marshall. Well, I'm glad to be here. I'm excited to be here. Um, uh, it was interesting last night. Uh, I was like, I know the passage and I know the title, but I can't remember what my sermon's about. <laughs> Have you ever had that? It's like, what? Uh, anyway, so it's going to be an adventure. So let's pray and ask God to just speak to us what he can do and uh, open our hearts and our minds. And Children's Church is dismissed. Yeah. There you go. Okay, let's pray. My Father, my God, I thank you for this day. I thank you for the opportunity to speak and just share what uh, you put in my heart and that you've been teaching me. And Lord, I pray that as we look at this important thing that we can be saved and know that we're saved. I pray that um, you will open our hearts and our minds to wisdom and understanding. That even if it's an old truth that we know when we accept, that this would encourage us. And if it's a new concept, that we'd be excited about it. And so, Lord, I just pray that you would help me to be excited and help others to be excited. And that we would share your love with others this week. In Jesus' name, amen. How many of you know a good rescue story? Don't we love a good rescue story? Come on, be honest. Do we like a good rescue story? I mean, practically every movie is a rescue story, right? There's something going on, and somebody has to get out of it. and We love that. And, I mean, we love to hear about firefighters going into buildings and saving, you know, everybody. Puppies and lizards and everything. You know, anything that was, could be hurt. We love hearing that. And um, we love the idea of soldiers liberating a country or or a, a death sentence, and someone comes and rescues them and takes them away. And um, I, I just think of, you know, the Lord of the Rings, you know, like, oh, the, the, there was rescue after rescue after rescue in that, that story. And it's just like, wow, we love that. But I want to tell you something. That's the heart of God for us. He wants to rescue us. He wants to save us from our bad choices, our decisions. That's the heart of God. And since we are made in the image and the likeness of God, that should echo in our hearts. That does echo in our hearts, right? That's why we love a good rescue story. Because we're made in his image, and God loves a rescue story because that's his story of history for us. That's the story of the Bible. It's a real rescue story. It's the greatest story ever told. That's why I can't believe we never tell it to anybody. We need to share it with people. We need, we need this. We can't rescue ourselves. We need somebody to rescue us. In Ephesians, the overall theme is who we are in Christ. That's the overall theme at the beginning of Ephesians. Who we are in Christ. What, what are we made in in Christ? And specifically in chapter 2, it talks about, I am saved. Thank you for the one person. That, yes, good. I am saved. Um, and throughout history, man has had these two options of being saved in their minds. And one of them was false, okay? And a lot of people believe that we can work for our salvation. I can work for my salvation. Most religions, spiritualities, uh, different things think about this as you can save yourself. Salvation by works. You can save yourself by doing certain things. You can save yourself by not doing certain things. You can be your own savior. That's the world's philosophy. You can do it yourself. Be all, your, be all you can be. Be your savior. I mean, look at some different religions. How about Buddhism? They say, stop following your desires and you can save yourself. Put away your desires. Confucius says that education and self-reflection and self-cultivation and a living is a living a moral life will save you. Hinduism says detach yourself and, and separate yourself from your ego and make an effort to live in unity with the divine to save yourself. Orthodox Judaism, they say repentance, prayer, and working hard to obey the law saves you. Toism is align yourself with Deo and have peace and harmony that saves you. Just have peace. You'll be fine. 
And in many people's minds, simply being a good person is good enough. Or how about this at funerals? Have you heard this before? Well, at least they're in a better place. It's like you can die and save yourself. Like dying saves you. But you've heard it. Come on, I've heard it. Or at least they're in a better place. Do this, don't do that, so that you'll be saved from whatever fate is set before you. We're not sure what's over there, but I'm sure you can handle it. That's salvation by works. The second one that Paul calls is grace. God through Paul calls grace. This is called Christianity, people. It's supposed to be what Christianity is about. We are saved by Jesus' work, not by ours. We're saved by what he did, not what we do. He is the only one who could do salvation by works. Do you realize that? He was the only one that could do it. The only one. We don't even come close. He's the only one that can save. He lives the life that saves. He did, not ours. Ours doesn't save us. His death saves, not our death. He rises to victory. Not our own victory, his victory. But yet everybody's looking at us. It's not about you, it's about Jesus. In you. In Christ. Jesus' name means to deliver, to rescue. Do you realize that? Jesus means to deliver, to rescue. Remember that faith alone doesn't save you. Did I just get all the ears perked up there? What do you mean faith alone doesn't save you? It's really true. Because it's the object of that faith that saves you. You hear that? Because a lot of people have faith in themselves. I can do it. Will that save them? They have faith. Oh, I can live the way I want. I know that I, I'm good enough. Or I went through the motions early on in life. You may be trusting in a false religion, a false morality, a false spiritual system, and that's not going to save you. You may have all the faith in the world in these things. That's not going to save you. You are not just saved by having faith in someone or something. The object of the faith needs to be the Savior who is Jesus Christ. Jesus alone is worthy. We just sang a bunch of songs about that. Do you remember them? I know it was five minutes ago. Do you turn off your brain when we're singing? Or do you listen to what you're saying? Because we say Jesus alone is our Savior. He, his blood alone saved me. I mean, look in Ephesians 2.5. I know we're skipping ahead, but look at this. Ephesians 2.5, it says, Even when we are dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved. And then jumping down to verse 8, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Faith is trusting Jesus' work, not in your own. But how many of us trust in our work? Well, I'm good enough now to be called his son or daughter. You'll never be good enough. It's only what Jesus did for you. That's what makes you equal with Jesus. A brother with Jesus Christ is what he did, not what you're doing. The Bible uses language of grace. That is Jesus' work, not ours. We're not saved by what we do or who we are. We're saved by who he is and what he does. That's grace. Thank you. This grace means unmerited favor, undeserved love. It gets me excited because the pressure's off me. Now it's relying on God to work through me. But how many of us try harder? No, don't try. Train harder. Train your mind to listen. Train your mind not to think that way. Train yourself to be a child of God. God pours out his affection, not just on undeserving. Listen, not just on undeserving, but ill-deserving people. We don't deserve anything. We're ill-deserving. We, we're at enemies with God. And yet God pours out his grace and favor on us. And yet some of us, when we feel those blessings, when God comes upon us, we reject him. Instead of saying, thank you, God, for who you are. Look at salvation in this way. You got the past, okay? In the past, we were saved from the penalty of sin. 
Think about that. The penalty of sin. Eternal separation from God. You are saved from that eternity. Is that not worth rejoicing right there? That should create joy in us. Are you kidding me? I often say, I don't care if I'm a sanitation worker in heaven. I'm in heaven. That's where I want to be. And whether I'm the lowliest person in heaven, I will be happy with that because I'm in the presence of God for eternity. But a lot of us sometimes don't think, well, I want to be mid-level in the kingdom. Then I'll be okay. I don't, John, you can be in the sewers. I'm not going to be down there. You'll be in the presence of God. I don't know if there's sewer, sewer, sewers in heaven, okay? <laughs> People are looking at me like, there's sewer workers in heaven? I don't. But, but that was an illustration for, to say, I don't care what position I hold because I'm going to be in the presence of God for eternity. And I'm not going to be in hell or the lake of fire for eternity. Jesus died on the cross in our place for our sins. This is the grace of God through which we are saved. Jesus died the death, punishment, and wrath that we should have endured. He endured it all. On the cross, he endured it all for us. If you are in Christ, there is no condemnation for sin. Thank you. You'll wake up. You'll get there. It's okay. There's no condemnation. How many of us condemn ourselves? Yes. Thank you. There's one honest one way in the back. Yes. We condemn ourselves. Oh, I blew it again. I blew it again. When we're training, when we're in sports, when we train and we fail, are we disappointed? Yes. But do we beat ourselves up? We shouldn't. We should look at it as a growing experience. Next time, I won't do that. Or I will do better at. I will train harder. And yet most of us fall into this, oh, I can't do it, I'm done. There's no condemnation, meaning God doesn't punish you when you sin. I sure feel punished. There's consequences. I mean, if you go into oncoming traffic with your car, there's going to be consequences. That's not a punishment. That's what happens. That's a consequence. But there is no eternal penalty for your sin. Do you hear that? That's awesome. That's grace. You can't lose your salvation. The penalty is paid for, period. Christ died, you didn't die. It was his sealing, not your sealing, on your heart. It was him doing everything for you, not you doing anything for him. This is grace. Jesus did, Jesus did it for us. The second is in the present. In the present. We're being saved by the power of sin. We are being saved from the power of sin. Did I mispronounce there? From. Okay, from. Let's get it straight. Thank you for correcting me. I'm glad. <laughs> Why did you say? From the power of sin. Jesus gives us new life. He puts the Holy Spirit in us. How? Why? To enable us to live by the power of God. If you've accepted, put your faith, hope, and trust in Jesus Christ, what he did on the cross, put it all on him, and believe that he's alive today, God's Holy Spirit is in you. Thank you. Yes. Amen. It's awesome. He enabled us to live by the power of God. The power of God is greater than our temptations. Do you believe that? Some, I've heard some people say, well, that's just the way I am. No. If you have your faith, hope, and trust in Jesus, you are a new creature, and now you have a choice. You can leave that temptation. And sometimes it's hard. But you can flee from it. Why do you think Jesus in the Lord's Prayer said, lead us not into temptation? Because he knows how weak we are. We should run from temptation like Joseph. People, a lot of people try to resist temptation. You know what we're supposed to resist? The devil. We're supposed to flee from temptation or distract our minds. That's where the battle is in our minds. If you get tempted and you start dwelling on it, what just happened? You've, you've fallen into it. But if you get tempted and then you suddenly distract yourself and you do something else, you quote scripture, you memorize scripture, you, you listen to a song of, of, about the Bible, about Jesus, 
what happens? You stop thinking about the temptation and you replace it with something new and good. Too many of us say we have to resist temptation, so I'm going to think about it all the time and just stand against it. You're going to fall. We're not perfect, but Christians make progress towards perfection by following him in his power. I can't break the cycle. I'm weak. I can't do anything. Yes, you can because you have the power of the Holy Ghost in you, the power of God in you. How many of us, said, be honest, how many of us during, the, during our lives have said, I can't change. I can't change. I've worked on this all my, I can't change. But I want you to know, as you grow, suddenly things will start changing. I told one of my, our fellow guys in here, um, when he first started coming to church, I never saw him smile. Now he smiles all the time. And I told him that the other day. I said, that's God working in you. And there's been some significant changes in his life. Scary changes. But yet now he's living in the joy of the Lord. He's not perfect, and he would be the first to tell you, but he's, he's growing. He's working his way towards perfection. And then we got the third in the future. We'll be saved from the presence of sin. Think about that. We're saved from our past sins. We're saved from the power of sin. Now we're going to be saved from the presence of sin. That's our future. What do you mean, John? The world started out perfect. And then Adam and Eve invited sin in by eating the fruit. And sin just... <sighs> That's why people strive to make heaven here on earth. You know that, right? Because they know they're missing something. This is all there is. We want it back. We want to have this heaven on earth. But we can't get free from the presence of sin. It's always there. No matter what you think that's going to make you happy, make you have heaven here on earth, it's not going to, be, it's not going to do it. Because the presence of sin is here. I mean, how many of us said, when I get married, everything's going to be awesome? Why are married people laughing? I don't understand. <laughs> you know, or how about when I get that job that I've always worked for? Or when I have that baby, that'll be it. Or when I get off of this addiction. Or when I, we just keep on looking, oh, then I'll be heaven here on earth. Wrong! Jesus in your life produces a, a desire to follow him and serve him. And we will not escape the presence of sin. The sin is all around us until we get to heaven to be with him. That's our future. That's the excitement. That's why I can say that being the lowliest position in heaven, I'll be happy. Because I will not have the presence of sin around me anymore. I will not be tempted. The devil will not be there. Come on, that's exciting. Even the most righteous person that feels, you know, they're doing well, can still feel the presence of sin in themselves. We have regrets. That's why none of us want a video of our life playing up here for all of us to see. Because we'd be ashamed and embarrassed because sin is there. That's why we need a Savior. <laughs> you guys, that's why we need Jesus. I don't, if someone would come and say, John, oh, you did this or that, you say, you know, you're right. That's why I need Jesus. And I'm sorry if I did something to offend you. I'm sorry if I did it on purpose or... Uh, not even knowing it, but I want you to know I'm sorry and I'm trying to become, I'm training to become more like Jesus and react like him. That's why we need a savior. <laughs> That's why the world needs a savior. If somebody wants to point at you and you're doing this, you're doing this, you're right. Admit it. I did it. You're right. But that's why I have Jesus. I'm forgiven. How about you? Then you might have to get off the ground because it hits you or something. I don't know. So the question is, are you saved? Are you saved? You can't say that I'm just a good person, and that's good enough. You are not your own savior. Well, I'm religious. You're not your own savior. I'm spiritual. You're not your own savior. I'm doing the best I can. You're not your own savior. Jesus Christ is the savior. You need Jesus. This might generate questions, right? And 
let's answer them from Paul's instruction and in order, okay? The first one is, we're saved from what? We're saved from what? A lot of people don't know the danger, so they feel that they need a savior. They, they, they feel like they need something, but they're not sure. If you are not saved or a Christian, you're not following him, you're under a sentence of death. That's why you feel that you need saving. You're under a sentence of death. We all were. That's why we hide when we do something wrong. We don't display it right out in the open of everyone. Why? Because we know it's wrong and we know we should be punished for it. Unfortunately, the world is getting more and more evil and they're starting to flaunt this in front of God. The question is, God's grace is awesome, but he's holy and just. And how long are those attributes going to be put aside until grace has run its course and the last person has put their faith, hope, and trust in Jesus Christ and we are raptured and then God's holiness and justice comes into the forefront. The cool thing is, God is still grace, has grace. He's still grace. But now is a time where that grace is on full display. Pretty soon his judgment and holiness will be on display. And that's a terrible thing to behold. A scary thing. So here it is, Ephesians 2, verse 1. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins. What does that mean? We're dead. We have no hope. In which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of our body and the mind, and we and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Six things that Christians were saved from. First, we're saved from being dead. We've moved from death to life. Thank you. Okay, we're going to get there. Okay, death to life. Jesus is the source of life. You are not the source of life. Jesus is. If you want to be raised... From death to life, you have to put your faith, hope, and trust in what Jesus Christ did. Then you'll be alive. I mean, think about electronics. You know, if you have something that runs on a battery, it runs for a while. But when that battery goes dead, what happens? It goes dead. You need to be plugged into the source. It's just like all our batteries have been taken out. And the only one that can bring us to life is Jesus Christ. I know it's a poor illustration, but it, it shows you we need Jesus. We can't do it on our own. We can't just sit here and say, oh, I'll be fine. No, you won't. Trespasses and sins, our thoughts, our words, our deeds, our motives. It includes sins of commission, where we actually do bad things, and sins of omissions, where we don't do what we should. How many of us sit on our hands while our neighbors don't even know about Jesus Christ? How many of us Instead of in love, going to someone and saying, what are you doing? Are you following the Lord? Is this what God would make God happy? Or do we sit on our hands? Oh, well, God will work it out. He's sovereign. I don't have to say anything. I will tell you this. If you go with a condemning attitude, don't say anything. We need to go in love and concern and bringing people what? To reconciliation with God. God loves them. Unholy lifestyles. Talk about here, uh, talking about here is worldly living. What's talking about here is worldly living. Okay? The unholy lifestyle. Worldly living. Rebellion against God. Everybody's doing it. Some of it must be okay. But morality is not determined by the majority. Do you hear me? Morality is not determined by the majority. If you know that it's wrong and you're doing it, you know what God calls that? Sin. Rebellion. Well, John, you don't know what my life has been like. God does. And God set the boundaries. Because of his love for you, not because of his hate. He doesn't have hate like that. 
his holiness and justice. And he says to live up to that. Please look at this. Practice it in your life. Train for it. Become more like my son. Well, I'm young, John. I have more years to go. You really know when you're dying? When, when, when are you going to die? Tell me. If you were to die, if you knew you're going to die in one week, would you change your behaviors? Then why are you still keeping them even though you don't know when you're going to die? We're saved from Satan and demon. There are God's peoples and enemies' peoples. The enemy is work is at work. At work at what? Destroying, deceiving, de decaying. The enemy wants everything in your life to decay, destroy, and be gone. And you may say, well, John, I, I really haven't any, had any problems with what I'm doing. We talked about this before. You're storing up wrath. Remember, for those that are unsaved, this is the best heaven they will ever have. For the saved, for the people that follow Christ, who put their faith on this is the worst hell you'll ever experience. I'd rather have this as the worst hell than the best heaven. Because this is not a very good heaven. Is it? I mean... I mean, look at this. Psalms 37, 4. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he'll give you the desires of your heart. You need a new inheritance. You need a new life. You need a new Adam. And when God puts that in you, you desire new things to follow Christ. And if you don't have that desire, you better think, did I accept Jesus Christ? Am I all in with Jesus? Or am I just playing the game? Because God knows, even if I don't, even if none of us do. But God knows your heart. Are you just playing with God, or are you serious about God? God's wrath. People try to downplay this. They don't want to talk about God's wrath. Come on, God, it's love. He's not going to do any of that. Really? I've got other verses. God is love. Like, I like this verse about love, but there's other verses about God's wrath, his holiness and justice that need to be satisfied. The problem is that they're making one attribute of God, God. And God has a bunch of attributes. And they're all good and just and holy and awesome. If God is only sovereign, then he is the author of sin. Did you hear me? If God is only forgiving, then nobody's going to hell. All of God's attributes work together. That's why he's loving and his desire is that everybody is saved. Yet he's holy, and he demands a payment for his holiness being violated. They work in the same. His desire that everybody comes to him. But the people that reject him, his justice and holiness needs to be satisfied. And they're not accepting the gift he's offered, the grace he's offered. God's most predominant attribute talked about in the Bible is God's holiness. Do you realize that? That's his most predominant attribute in the whole Bible, God's holiness. Holiness of God. The God's wrath is talked about 600 times. And 600 times it talks about God's wrath. That's supposed to create a sense of urgency. His holiness, the biggest attribute. His wrath, 600 times. Because his holiness had been offended. There's no second chance. This life is a chance you have. People wish there was a second chance. But where does faith come in when you're standing in the presence of God? It's pretty easy to believe at that point, is it not? You know, to tell you the truth right now, here, just looking around, can you see the evidence of God? God is here in the things we've seen. That's why we have testimony time at the end of the service. So you can share and encourage others about what God is doing and done in your life. So you can say, yes, there's God. That's what God's doing. Here it is. A stranger paying off your debt. Jesus comes and pays off your debt. Pays off your future debt. It's all done. He did it. All you have to do is accept it. Yes, I accept it. 
but so many say, I'll work for it to pay it off. How many of you would reject somebody coming and saying, I'll pay your house off as a gift, free and charge? No, let me work at it. I want the 30-year loan. Ephesians 2, 4. For God, being rich in his mercy because of his great love for which he loved us, loved with, with he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. We have been saved by what? Grace. grace. But how many of us say, no, I need to work for it. I need to earn God's grace. He lived, he died, he rose, he rose, and he's reigning today in heaven. It proves that Jesus is the only way, period. I'm sorry if that's offensive. But Jesus said, I'm the only way. And that's what everybody in the whole history of time is going to have to face. Who is Jesus the Christ? Thank you. But everybody's going to answer that kneeling here on earth and saying, you're the Son of God, or kneeling in heaven before Jesus saying, you're the Son of God. And I have to tell you, if you don't kneel here on earth for salvation, you're going to kneel in heaven for damnation. I don't want you to kneel in heaven for damnation. I want you to kneel here on earth so that when you kneel in heaven, you're glorifying God for eternity. What's the greatest gift you have ever received from someone? themselves. God gave himself to you in the form of Jesus Christ. Is that a good gift? I mean, we talked about it in marriage. Husband and wife, they don't give gifts to one another. They give each other to each other. That's the gift. I'm here for you. God did that for us. That's exciting. Here we go. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. This is grace, not of works, people. Get it out of your mind. After we are saved, we, are try, we try, we change, and we try to do things to change the game. We train things to change the game. After, we are, after we're saved, I have to do this and I have to do this for the glory of God. But here's the thing. We don't have to be anywhere to be in a holy place to do this. We don't have to be in a holy building or a holy position or a holy dress or holy whatever to really worship God. We have to do it in our hearts and worship God in relationship with him. That's our focus. That's our goal. Look at this, Ephesians 2, 6, going back here. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that when the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing, it's a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand, and we should walk in them. We are saved for what? We're saved for works. John, wait a minute. What are you talking about? Didn't you just get done saying works and grace? Give me a moment here. How many of us say, oh, I gave my life to Christ? How many of you said that? I gave my life to Christ. Wait, wait. God gave his life for us. We live for God because what he's done for us. See the difference there? Because of what he's done, it's not like, hey, okay, God, now it's good. I'm giving my life to you. Now it's all complete. No. God chose us. God saved us. He gave himself for us. Christians aren't better or smarter. They're blessed. I'm not better or smarter. I'm not. Man, if, everybody, if anybody thinks that you're that, you say, no, I need a Savior just like you. I'm just blessed because I've chosen to believe. So we're saved for works. And I got that reaction. What? 
Haven't you been pre preaching no works? The key is to get the works in the right order. Jesus' works saves us. Jesus' work in us as his workmanship. Jesus works through us as an act of worship. Our works are the result of his work in us. But we want to go before his work and do our work. See, well, I'm good enough. I saved myself. Look, God saved me. No, I saved myself and my work. Wrong. It's what Jesus' work did in, through, and outward. It's his work in us that creates the work that we have to do. False religion, spiritualities, moral, moral, moralities teach this. Here are the works that will save you. Wrong. That's wrong. Works that God's working through you to work for the body of Christ and for others to put their faith, hope, and trust in Jesus Christ. Seven things about good works. All works by God's grace for God's glory are good works. You see that? All works by God's grace for God's glory are good works. How many works? A mom at 3 a.m. in the morning when the baby's crying, needs a changing, needs a feeding, mom gives up to do that. Is that a good work? Done to the glory of God? That's a good work. Somebody vacuuming the church that nobody ever sees, is that a good work? Is it stopping, picking up a stranger to take them where they need to be? All works are good works, even the ones you think are just, mm. God's grace empowers good works in us. Even the minor things is good works to God, and God sees it. Isn't that awesome? Number two, most of Jesus' good works were as a carpenter, not as a preacher. I want you to think about that for a second. Because what do we focus on? Of course, his teaching. When he was uh, baptized to be the priest, the, the representative of God, he walked around and taught us and, and did great miracles, God doing things through him. But that was for three years of his life. How long? We traditionally think of Jesus living 33 years at least, right in that area. So for 30 years, he was subject to the authority of his parents and lived as a carpenter in training. Think about that for a minute. His whole life was an act of worship. Think about it. The Son of God was subject to two human beings. Could you imagine, Mom and Dad, people, if you were the parents of the Son of God? <laughs> A little bit of pressure at all? But Jesus lived a perfect life, even in that position. I mean, how many of you would be tempted? Why don't you live like your brother Jesus? There's no such thing, number three, as sacred or secular work for Christians. That's important. If you love Jesus, it's a worshipful, it's a worshipful job, whatever you're doing. You don't have to be in full-time Christian service. You're already in full-time Christian service. Whether it's your work, at school, at home, underneath the authority of your parents, wherever it is, that work is sacred if it's to the glory of God. You doubt me. Okay, 1 Corinthians 10, 31. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the? All. You mean I can eat to the glory of God? When's the last time you thanked God for the food you ate? Just yesterday, Teresa and I were walking, um, hiking way out somewhere, and uh, we came upon a homestead, an old homestead. And I was just thinking, 150 years ago, what would be our focus? Survival. Farming, you know, making sure we had enough money to make it through the winter and eat. Aren't you glad you live in this time? Aren't you just say, God, thank you for letting me live at this time where I don't have my main 
focus is survival. Think about it. I was thinking about that. I, I wouldn't be hiking. You know, preaching would be a part-time job or, you know, I, I'd have to farm or do something. Number four, when you need to discover the good works God has set before you, what do I need to do to get ready for God's work for me? What should I be doing? Praying. Yes, praying. Get in the book. Talking to others. What is God preparing you to do? And I hear people all the time, oh, oh, I just want God to show me his perfect will. You know, Teresa and I were like that. Oh, show us what you want us to do. And we were doing youth group and worship and doing all this thing at their home church. And the pastor would get so mad at us. You're already doing what God wants you to do. Don't worry about the future. God will take care of it. Just keep on doing what God's called you to do faithfully now because then he'll give you more in the future. If you can't be faithful right now, how are you going to be faithful when real pressure comes? What are you talking? There's worse? Yes. Be faithful now. Number five, infuse your current work with grace. How to deal with whatever is going on. The bosses, the kids, the spouse, the family. It's driving me crazy. How do you deal with it? In a godly way or in a worldly way? But I love him. I love her. I want to do this. That's how the world works today. Is God the God of all time? Yes. Morality is not determined by popular vote. It's determined by God. With God's help, infuse your work and your relationships with his grace. We are not saved by our works, but we are saved to our works. You see that? Next one. Number six. We are not saved by our works, but we are saved to our works. See the difference there? They're not the root of our faith. They're the fruit of our faith. Thank you, Jeff. You're not, you're, they're not what brings us into a relationship with God. They're what comes out of our relationship with God. That's the works we're talking about. Number seven. God does not need our works, but our neighbor does. Hear that? God does not need our works, but our neighbor does. God can take care of himself, can he? He's God. He doesn't need us, but he chooses to use us. These things are what our neighbor needs. It's a way of loving our neighbor and showing the love that Jesus has shown for us. That's good works. And every one of us in this building, if we put our faith, hope, and trust in Jesus Christ, can show good works to people, to our neighbor. And if you haven't accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, listen. Tell me who Jesus is. You will answer it. And you only have three choices. He's either a liar, a lunatic, or he's truly the Son of God. And you will be responsible for your answer. Just saying, oh, he was a good man, that's not good enough. Because Jesus told everybody over and over, I'm the son of God. With that statement, you have to determine, is he telling the truth? Is he a lunatic? Or is he outright lying? What is it? He's proven it over and over. Please come to the Lord. Give up your life. Say, Lord, I accept what your son has done on the cross. I give my life. I can't save myself. I give everything to you. Take it. Train me to be more like your son. Save me from the penalty of sin. I need you, Jesus. Let's pray. My Father, my God, I thank you for this lesson. And Lord, I pray that it touched people's heart. It touched my heart. And Lord, I pray that we will realize that we're saved and that you have a work for us right here, right now. I pray that it, we're amped up and ready to tell others and ready to show that. Lord, thank you for saving us. Thank you for choosing us. And Lord, I pray for everyone here that doesn't know you, that they accept you as son, your son as Savior. And Lord, I pray for our neighbors, that you'll help us to share that love with them and they'll accept you as, as, 
as the Son of God, accept your Son as the Son of God. And I pray this whole community would change to following you and honoring you. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.